birthdays. Um, I see there are a few new folks, so I want to introduce myself. I'm Kristen Mari, and I chair the master's program. I'm also um, a faculty in this department of population, family, and reproductive health. And for those of you that are new also to this, um, each presenter will make um, a scientific presentation for 10 minutes, followed by about five minutes of Q&A. And I will open up the floor um, with priority to student questions first. But if I don't see a student question, then I will go with faculty. Um, so that's how it works. So I think we can go ahead and introduce our first um, presenter. And I would also like to remind all of you that um, to please mute yourself so that we can make sure that we all hear the presentation. So on that note, I'd like to welcome Omaris Caceres. Um, she is an MSPH um, candidate. Uh, they went to Georgetown University School of Nursing and Health Science, where they got a Bachelor of Science in Global Health. So Omaris, I'm going to have you go ahead and share your screen, and you can um, also talk about the title of your essay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Amadis Caceres. I pronounce it they, she, and I'm going to be talking today about some data assessment, well, a data assessment that I've conducted with um, data systems that are utilized by USAID's key populations programs in South Africa. Admittedly, this is a bit chunky and it's a lot to get through in 10 minutes. So I am very excited to get to questioning at the end because I know this will be a lot, but I'm excited. Um, and so let's see if I can work this. There we go. Um, this is just an outline, uh, just a quick overview of the topics that I'll be touching on today. Um, but first, I wanted to provide some background on the current landscape of HIV in South Africa. So when considering South Africa nationally, uh, UNAIDS reports that in 2020, there were about 7.8 million adults and children living with HIV, with the incidence being reported at 4.6 per 1,000 person years of all ages, or 230,000 newly infected cases in 2020. And so for those who are not familiar with the terminology of key populations, uh, these populations are groups of people who are considered to be of elevated risk of HIV due to marginalization and a range of social, behavioral, and economic factors. So USAID's um, key populations program in South Africa focuses on three of those key populations, that being transgender persons, female sex workers, and gay men and men who have sex with men. Um, and all three of these communities in South Africa are of elevated risk of HIV nationally, but are also limited in the access to HIV prevention and treatment services. Therefore, um, when looking at USAID's key populations programs, the aim of the programs is to serve as advocates and provide accessible HIV services, such as PrEP, such as PrEP, arts, and other HIV-related social services, via quality and human rights affirming programming to the communities that they serve. Um, and when mapping these programs, USAID has three implementing partners throughout South Africa, um, including ANOVA's Ivan Tom's Clinic, serving MSM in the Western Cape, Out and Engagements Health, serving MSM in Johannesburg and the Eastern Cape, and VITS RHI, serving female sex workers and transgender persons in Johannesburg and the Eastern Cape. And so as a part of my capstone, uh, my team and I here at JHU conducted in-person informal consultative discussions from January 2021, from November 2021 to January 2022 with the implementing partners to learn more about their programs and map their existing data programs. And all of our um, conversations were summarized in written reports and used in my analysis for the data system assessment that I conducted. And so I think I've been talking a lot about data systems and I kind of want to give a context to why do we really care about these data systems as public health professionals. Um, I kind of like to use this metaphor of this bridge where um, these data systems are acting as a bridge between the public health problem. So in this situation, the population wide impact of HIV and um, providing HIV services to these key populations and the understanding and the impact of the reach of these programs. So data systems allow us to be able to get a snapshot into the impact of the HIV services and the potential impact they're having on the community that they serve. Um, and this is a vital aspect whenever we're thinking about advocacy, both in the continued funding of these programs and for the assurance that these services are actually serving these communities in impactful ways. And so 
when looking down at this blue box or the bottom box um, for this slide for our data assessment, the kind of the goal was to identify um, barriers and facilitators for three different um, system processes. The first being the collecting of routine program data. The second being the um, ensuring and processing and storage of high quality and accurate program data. And the third being the internal and external data dissemination. And so um, to kind of frame and guide my analysis, I utilize the consolidated framework for implementation research, also known as CIFR, uh, because the structure kind of encourages the evaluation of a range of essential factors that are involved in the implementation process. And for those who aren't really familiar with implementation science, um, I kind of want to give a, some type of background to explain this framework and how I utilized it. So I created this visual um, and would like to walk you all through it real quick before we dive into the results of the data assessment. So in my analysis, I utilized three domains shown via the three different circles. Um, the first domain was the inner setting, which is the innermost circle um, in the visual, which includes factors related to key population organizations themselves. Um, and these associated factors are listed in the yellow box. Low pause for effect. Um, the second domain is process, which is the middle circle in the visual that includes factors related for the implementation of data systems and processes the implementing partners have developed related to the data processes. I know that's a lot, but those factors are listed in the blue square. And the third domain is outer setting, which is the outermost circle in the visual that considers factors outside of the organizations. So um, these are factors that are listed in the green box. And so I listed um, or like organized my results by these different domains. And first looking at the outer setting, um, I listed here some generalized bullet points to outline facilitators and barriers to each data process. But given the limited time of the presentation, I'll only speak more in depth to those that are bolded. Um, one of the factors identified to data collection processes is the Protection of Personal Information Act, also known as PAPIA which is a federal act implemented in South Africa in July of 2020 to protect the sharing of personal information of clients. And since the implementation of PAPIA, the implementing partners have found that the act has allowed for clients to trust the organizations to protect their personal data and therefore have been providing more honest responses uh, to surveys being conducted. With that said, PAPIA has also been a barrier to data collection uh, as partners have needed to add additional processes such as signed permission forms to be able to utilize personal data to contact their clients and conduct follow-up visits. And then this then places limits on longitudinal data, data that can be collected um, related to individual clients and uh, kind of creates challenges in efforts for client retention in the programs. The impacts of Papia have also shown up within data dissemination Implementing partners are unable to export um, individual level data from government data systems, such as, uh, and this is on effort to protect the client information. But this means that if implementing partners want to share individual level data, they either need to utilize additional data systems to allow them to de-identify individual level data dissemination or limit their data dissemination to outside organizations to site level data only. And that then places limits on the types of analysis that can be conducted by partner organizations, such as us here at JHU. At the process level, I want to highlight one barrier to data collection and one facilitator to data quality assurance. So a barrier to data collection as bolded here on the slide is the inability to modify HIV indicators in government data systems. And so for more context, um, when implementing partners receive support from the Department of Health, health or provincial health departments in South Africa, uh, the DOH requires the partners to utilize specific data systems to track HIV indicators. And that data is then used by the organizations uh, for healthcare planning and processes related to HIV nationally. But with that said, many of these healthcare indicators are not ran specifically with key populations in mind, nor track program quality indicators. And therefore, if implementing partners choose to not develop their own data systems for data collection, they're then limited to imperfect HIV indicators that do not really meet the needs of their clients. A facilitator I want to highlight at the process level is the use of assigned barcodes and unique IDs to track clients' paperwork and data over time. 
One of the challenges implementing partners often face is ensuring accurate identification and tracking of their clients within their data systems. And so given concerns related to safety and desired privacy related to HIV stigma, clientele often use nicknames uh, when seeking HIV services, or if they do use their government official names, uh, there are still barriers to identification due to culturally common names. I think when I was in South Africa, I heard probably the same 15 names <laughs> used over and over again, which definitely becomes an issue whenever you're trying to identify um, your clients. And therefore barcodes and unique IDs um, help programs to be able to track individual clients and ensure that they're providing sustained care to their clientele. And then at the inner setting, I wanted to highlight two factors that are specific to key population programs. Um, USA key population programs all utilize mobile vans and clinics to allow them to conduct outreach and provide HIV services directly to hard to reach persons within their own communities and places of work. Um, and while this is a huge highlight of the programs, these mobile clinics also deal with elevated safety risks given the locations of, that their clientele is often work in. So we're talking about bars, clubs, and under-resourced and segregated townships. Um, if anyone knows the context of South Africa, which can then to lead to elevated safety risk and robberies of the vans. Um, therefore, while the mobile clinics um, allow for implementing partners to collect really important and vital data um, and be able to provide services whenever addressing things such as transportation bar barriers in this population, um, they also have to rely on paperwork and are unable to bring tablets and other technology directly into the field for the data collection processes. And so I know that was a lot, but the main takeaways I kind of had personally had gotten from the data assessment is that the implementing partners have displayed a sense of adaptability in the ways that they have responded to outside demands from partner um, and governmental organizations while still prioritizing the needs of their clients. And this has involved uh, the implementation of additional processes into their data systems to adjust for changes related to Apopia. Uh, choosing to utilize additional data systems beyond those mandated by the government, their use of unique IDs and barcodes to better serve their established clients, and balancing their staff safety while addressing transportation barriers uh, for their clients by using the mobile clinics. And therefore, the direct next step to this research is to present the findings back to the implementing partners and the other members of the consortium. Um, so this is USAID, the Panagora Group, and FHI 360 and to collaborate as um, a consortium to, on how we can support the capacity building of these data systems. And so this will involve the dissemination of the findings of the data system assessment while encouraging continued engagement with the implementing partner organizations. And as a research team, we will continue our learning on the data systems as we collaborate on data analysis projects with the implementing partners and using the routinely collected HIV program data in our own future research. And yes, I want to give a big thank you to a lot of people that made this data assessment and this project happen, um, but a lot to USA and the Panagora Group, FHI 360, and the implementing partners themselves. Um, it was great being able to meet a lot of the people involved in these organizations. Big shout out to the JHU research team, um, my first reader, Dr. Stefan Baral, uh, Kate Rosinski, Kylie Willis, um, and Mark Lieber. Um, support for my in-country travel. For those who don't know, I was able to be in South Africa from September to December of last year. So to Global Health Savage Field Placements, TBHIV Care, the study team, um, and the team that I worked with there, Sheree Schwartz, Lily Ship, Carly Commons, and Marie Schoen. And then I want to give an extra special shout out to the department, specifically to Beth Frederick, who is my second reader and one of the best advisors a student could ask for. Um, and also for my two peers, Gretchen and Haley, for supporting me along the way. They took uh, a lot of phone calls while I was abroad and provided a lot of support, um, and especially to my cohort. And uh, it's just been a great experience. And it's so sad to be thinking about graduation next week. But if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I'll also open up the space for any questions anyone may have. Thank you so much. This was fabulous. Wonderful work. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Yay. All right. This was so exciting. And also, I just want to say how amazing it was for you to be able to travel too during this time. So, um, yes, no, I was a little note to everyone. I was in South Africa when they announced the new variant. So it was yeah. a great time to travel. <laughs> <laughs> great time to be evacuated, kind of. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, 10 out of 10 experience. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so let's open with, on that note, let's let's open it up to questions. I see Gretchen and, and Mona. So Gretchen, you're first and then we'll go to Mona. Omaris, um, amazing, amazing, amazing work and such a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much for walking us through that. Um, one of the questions that I had was in terms of, I didn't seem to notice any sort of prevalence of transgender persons um, mentioned. And so I wanted to see if you had insights as to why South Africa doesn't really have those estimates um, mm -hmm. for that specific key population. Yeah, I think, um, and this is speaking very broadly, I think a bit, but I think there is a bit of this new transition within key, po key populations work of separating out. I think in the past, oftentimes we grouped men of sex with men and transgender women were often very much grouped in studies. And I think there is now this movement of piecing out and seeing how different um, the needs are in these two different communities. And while I could have provided um, a prevalence for transgender women, I also want to recognize that uh, the organizations that I was working with, anytime they talk about transgender persons, they were talking very broadly and in supporting other groups. And so I tried to dig very hard to find a really good prevalence. And there is a lot of research saying that there is an elevated prevalence. They are a key population and they do deserve um, having services that are navigated towards their needs separately from MSM. Um, but it was very hard to find a prevalence for them. So I think for me, if, if I were to keep on doing research in this field, I think there's definitely something I'm very interested in and providing those estimates. Um, yeah, thank you, Gretchen, great question. <laughs> Great, and let's turn it to Mona. Yes, okay, let me also echo Gretchen's praise because such an amazing presentation. Thank you so much, I've learned a lot. Um, something I was thinking is, do you actually think that the location of the implementing partners actually had an impact on maybe how they navigated their data processes? Or you know, is it like a universal thing across the entire country? I'm not too sure. Yeah, I think, I think a big part of our analysis was a bit of a mapping process because um, for those who don't know South Africa politics, um, most of the country is, is dominated by one party at the moment, the ANC, um, except for the province of the Western Cape, which is where our partner ANOVA is located, uh, which is more dominated by the DA. So actually I had this great time of really learning about how um, the Western province kind of has this completely own different like government mandated like systems. And like it has a whole completely different process they, that they kind of utilize. And so whenever we're thinking as like partners, because I think this was context that we didn't have. So whenever we conducted the data assessments, we actually learned a lot about how actually very different the data um, system needs are just off a of location. Like we're not, we're going past like key populations or anything. We're just like, just because of where you're located, we're talking about very different data systems, very different capacities. Um, I think our partners in ANOVA deal a lot more with, I'm really bad with this word, but municipal city <laughs> level um, requirements and providence level requirements while our partners, for example, in Johannesburg, we were dealing with a lot more of national level type of, of um, kind of outside influences and things like that. So it was a really interesting process and kind of why I developed the map. And I think it's still a conversation that our team is having on how we can support uh, these data systems. But thank you, Mona. That was also a really good question. 10 out of 10. <laughs> okay, we have um, time for one more. Okay, let's go, Ishita. Yeah, uh, great job, Omaris. So uh, my question is, can you talk a little bit more about your process of preparing for your in-person meetings with partners? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anyone on my team is on this call, but shout out to my team, first and foremost, because it was definitely a collaborative process, process with the DHU team of kind of using past surveys that have been utilized. I know one of the surveys we used was actually implemented, implemented in Burma, which was an interesting way of, of thinking about data systems in that way. Um, I also utilized a bit of a SWOT analysis, um, which I think is always very useful in these contexts of evaluations. Um, I did some research with WHO's data quality assurance processes and kind of what they would do. I mean, those pro WHO's processes are like, the first thing was like, this may take months. And I was like, well, I have a weekend. So <laughs> how do we modify this to be more useful for the time constraint that we have? And then, um, I also think a big part of it 
was I, I, conduct, I conducted these um, conversations at the end of my field placement, so towards November, December stage. So I've been working for two months with one of our CDC partners, um, TB HIV care in Durban, South Africa. And I think that there's a lot of lessons that you can still learn by having like a very that in-person experience of learning about their experiences of collecting data and the research process that then I wanted to bring into that I think formulated my own questions, especially Poppy. I don't know if there's anyone here who's been working with uh, South African partners. I think Poppy has just had a really big impact on kind of how we think about it recently, um, our partnerships. I think that kind of really formulated a lot of the questions and brought up a lot of this um, framework to my conversations that ended up being like, I talk about it more in my, uh, essay but like ended up being like four or five hour conversations where I was just aggressively writing notes and just trying to get as much information as possible um from my partners who were all like I said amazing people but yes thank Great. you everyone thank you so much again <laughs> wonderful job thank you thank you all right yes. so our next presenter is Diana Chute and she um is coming to us from University of Delaware with a bachelor's in child psychology. And the title of her presentation is called Improving Family Economic Wellbeing Through Home Visiting, The Moderating Effects of Maternal Motiv Motivation on Program Impacts. So Diana, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. What's going on? All right, so um, Kristen just mentioned my title there. So I'll just say that I started off with a uh, little bit of dose of dopamine for everyone by looking at this mother uh, daughter pair here. So for my presentation, I'm looking at family economic well-being and the role of uh, maternal motivation as a moderator of program home visiting program impact on family economic well-being. And to put things in perspective first, um, in terms of poverty, the 2020 US Census reported that 23.4% of female headed households were living in poverty. And then 11.6 million children were living in poverty. So it's a big problem within the United States. Now, family economic well being encompasses a lot of things. Uh, a few of them are financial stability, economic resources, so housing, food, um, access to health insurance, and then also family safety and health. Now, in the absence of family economic well being, we can see effects on parenting style. So, if parents are stressed, they may engage in harsher parenting. Also, uh, maternal and child health could be influenced. So, mothers could, you know, get mood disorders such as depression, and children may have uh, social, emotional, developmental delays, among other things. So in talking about home visiting program and family economic well-being, I'll first, so first describe what uh, home visiting is uh, so that folks who are not familiar will, will be familiar. So home visiting is a two generation service strategy that connects expectant mothers and their children with trained social support workers. So a nurse or social workers, these programs promote maternal and child health. There are a number of ways that home visiting improves family economic well-being, and these could include building parental skills and knowledge, and also linking parents to job training and education programs. Six of the 20 evidence-based home visiting models have shown favorable overall effects on family economic well, and well-being, and so reporting overall effects could be masking effects for subgroups, given the diversity of the families that home visiting programs serve. So it's important to achieve precision in home visiting to understand what works best 
for whom, in which contexts, why, and how. And identification of subgroups may help us to do this. So in this study, I chose to look at motivation for several reasons. And the first is that it's a driver of behavior. It's why we choose to perform a behavior. It's involved in initiation, continuation, and in termination of behaviors. And it's not static over time. It can change. And as shown in the figure to the right, you'll see that motivation is complex interaction between the external and internal environment. Motivation includes intentions, beliefs, wants, urges, and it's a force that acts within a person that creates a disposition to engage in a goal-directed behavior. So in home visiting, it may, may allow us to think about a mother's individual needs for once. So does she even believe a change is beneficial to her? Also, another reason I chose motivation is that it's been extensively studied in other uh, human services. So for example, um, addiction research, uh, it has been shown to be a moderator of program impact in that field. And also it's been shown to initiate change and optimize treatment outcomes. And finally, it is a modifiable trait. And to my knowledge, this is the first study that has uh, looked into motivation as a moderator of any outcome indicator for home visiting. And I chose to look at family economic well-being because of its impact on um, parenting style, maternal and child health. So my research question was, does mother's motivation to continue school or seek employment moderate a state level home visiting programs impact on indicators of family economic well-being? So this was a secondary data analysis of a randomized controlled trial of Healthy Families Alaska. And HFAK was a large statewide program evaluation co conducted by Ann Duggan and her colleagues here at Johns Hopkins. And this is a rich data source that I was allowed the opportunity to work with. I was able to build upon what I learned during my field placement with her group. So within the intervention group, there were 126 mothers and within the control, there were 123. I used one single data source, and that was the structured maternal interviews taken at baseline, and then two years following the birth of the baby. In terms of constructing my maternal motivation uh, moderators, I took categorical responses and converted them into binary vari variables to create those. And you'll see in blue on the left there that mothers were scored high in maternal motivation if they were currently in school and if they had thoughts to return to school within the next 12 months. And we had four education indicators at two years following the birth, including completing a training program or degree. On the right, you'll see our employment motivation moderators. And these include has plans to return or go to work after the baby's birth and also has plans to start or go to work before the baby turns 12 months old. And there were five indicators of employment two years after the baby's birth. When we took a look at our sample uh, characteristics, we saw that 53% of this population was living below the federal poverty level. And then we also took a look at uh, differences in education and employment motivation between the groups. Unfortunately, we didn't see any uh, significant differences there. We also didn't observe any differences in our education and employment indicators at baseline either. The only significant group differences that there were was married or living with a partner or poor psychological resources, which were all controlled for in subsequent analysis. So the first thing that we did was to use multiple and logistic regression on the nine indicators to test for program impact, controlling for attributes for which the groups differed significantly. And what we found was no overall program impact at year two on the education or employment indicators. So this made it important to examine uh, moderators to see what might be contributing to these findings. So in this case, we looked at a turtle motivation as a moderator. Next, to examine the role of maternal motivation as a moderator of program impact on family economic well being, we repeated the analyses that were shown in the previous slide. This time, we included a group by motivation interaction term to test for moderation. 
So here for the two, year two education indicators, we found no significant moderated effects of maternal motivation on home visiting program impact. We did, however, see a trend of moderated effects on one indicator. And that indicator was mothers completing a training program or degree as shown in the chart to the right. And you'll see that I have that highlighted uh, in a box in red there. So among mothers with low education motivation, the percentage of mothers completing a training or degree program was higher in the HFAK group than it was in the control group. And we found, sorry, we found no significant moderated effects of maternal employment motivation on any of the employment and outcome indicators. We did observe a uh, interesting pattern of effects with mothers with low motivation. And so while they weren't significant, what we did observe was program impacts on six of the nine education and employment indicators were greater for mothers with low motivation than mothers with high motivation as shown in the highlighted in red, the odds, odds ratios there. So this could suggest that home visiting services may be helpful in moving mothers with family initially low motivation closer to activities aligned with improving economic well-being. So in terms of like where and why we may expect to have seen or why we may have seen these findings, um, there could have been associations with maternal motivation and barriers, so structural barriers and social determinants of health. So regardless of high or low motivation, if a mother lacks childcare or economic, uh, family economic well-being. Also, again, motivation is not is dynamic. It's not a static personality trait. And so home visiting session to session changes could have happened. And so mothers starting out with high motivation, for example, may have ended with low motivation. It's hard to say. Also in pulling from behavioral economics, we can think about present bias. And this includes like mother's belief that her return on investment of going back to school or work is too far into the future and the benefits of doing that are uh, uncertain to her. There were a few limitations to this study. So it was a secondary data analysis of the HFAK program evaluation, which wasn't specifically designed to measure motivation. And we also created education and employment motivation using the available data that we had. Second, this was an exploratory analysis of motivation as a moderator. So we didn't have a standardized measure of motivation. And also, we didn't explore moderation of other measures of family economic well being. And these could include community and governmental assistance, as well as health insurance. So, what are some considerations for future research? I think it's important to explore additional frameworks. Um, motivation may not be mutually exclusive. So, combining capability, opportunity, and motivation may be a better moderator of home visiting program impact on family economic well being. And this is especially true when we think about social determinants of health and their influence on outcome indicators of family economic well being. Also, uh, when thinking about motivation and precision, maybe worthwhile to identify, identify what motivates a mother so that we can reinforce her behavior by considering different types of motivation, such as intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And you can see there intrinsic, mothers are motivated by enjoyment, pur purpose, growth, extrinsic might be motivated by promotion, praise, perks. And so this doing this, um, will allow us for the continued examination regarding how we can use motivation to achieve precision in home visiting, to look at what works best for whom, in which context, why, and how. And then finally, I had a great experience with the program, two thumbs up in my book. And I'd like to thank everyone in the field placement that I had with Hark. it was great. So my advisor, Kay O'Neill and second reader, my first reader, Lori Burrell, uh, Burl who put up with me. <laughs> and then Ann Duggan, she was great. And I appreciate 
um, you giving me the opportunity to think of things in a different way. Um, all of this has been great. I'd like to thank Cynthia, our department chair, chair, and all of the professors that I had. This was great. And Kristen McCormick, and also my family. Can't forget them. <laughs> my husband, Whitney, my twin sister, Dana, my mom and dad. And then my former mentors, who I see are on this call, Mary Dozier and Diana Fishbein. So I really appreciate it. And thanks, 2022 cohort. Good luck to you guys. Yay! Way to go, Diana. This is wonderful. So let's open it up for questions. This was an interesting analysis that you did. Okay. And I do have my chat box open this time. So, um, so I can finally read. I didn't have it um, the first one. So sorry about that. But I do have it open now. I have a question, Kristen. Yes, go ahead. OK, so I first want to say, Diana, congratulations. I'm so proud of you. Um, and it's so great to see all the work unfold. I do have a question about um, your questions that you mentioned with the um, motivation moderators for the employment and education, maternal education. I was wondering how you ended up with those questions um, specifically for those two factors. Yeah, that's a great question, Simona. So. There were a lot of questions, obviously, within this uh, baseline measure uh, during the HFAK program evaluation. So what I did was I looked at the different components of motivation. So in that figure with the, with the blue head there, you had a, lit a lot of different things. So beliefs, wants. Uh, and so what I did was I took questions that were related to those components of motivation, and I pulled them aside and combined them together. So that's kind of how I selected those. So took a lot of reading and learning about motivation there, but Lori and I were able to find some stuff in that database. <laughs> Great. Uh, Mona, I see your hand up again. Yeah, sorry. I don't want to, I don't want to hog the questions, but first of all, all <laughs> okay. these presentations are amazing. Diana, I thought it was fantastic. Um, such interesting work. And um, I was actually curious, do you think that there's other ways that you see motivation actually contributing to increasing the precision in home visiting that you were sort of talking about earlier? Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I'm like glad you asked. <laughs> that's like my whole field placement, pretty much. <laughs> so, um, in terms of precision, we don't just have to think about the um, home visitors. We can also think about or the uh, mothers. We can also think about the home visitors and how motivation may influence their um, engagement and retention in these programs. So we can think about those as moderators. Um, throughout these, these programs. I hope that helps. <laughs> okay, well, oh, David, I see. Or uh, Donna, uh, sorry, you. Donna was I, first and then I, David. Mm -hmm. Donna was first, yes. Donna, I think you Sorry just about there. that, my hand went, went down. Okay, so I asked a question in the chat. So, so Diane, um, or Diana, um, I, I found it interesting that you had this, what looked like a potential interactive effect for the low motivated moms. And to me, that's the group that, you know, frankly is, should be targeted in home visiting. I mean, we, we often sort of don't necessarily target the most needy individuals always in, in home visiting. I know that that's true certainly for some of the, the, the studies during pregnancy. And I wondered if, you think how much you think sample size plays a role you had a really small sample to be able to look at interactive effects so are there additional data that are going to become available to do a, a larger analysis to see if in fact there is an interactive effect for the low motivated moms well what we had was we took the um the mothers that we had baseline data on and then end line data at year two. So that reduced our sample size down to what it was. And so- yeah, Okay, um, he's just gotta get settled in there. <laughs> now, okay, I think sorry. somebody is, somebody needs to go off mute. You know, I think it's Bree. Bri. Bree needs to go on mute. Bree, is it Bree? Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, we were limited to the 240 okay. 
All right. And, you know, it might be an interesting exercise just to think as if the sample size were doubled, would you would you see a significant effect? I mean, and, you know, thinking about sort of what what um, just thinking about sample size calculations, because it is a potentially interesting effect. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 nice work. Um, you know, I usually say nice work to everyone at the end rather than cluttering the chat box. But really, really well done. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and I think like having moving forward, having um, standardized measures of motivation would be would be very helpful. Um, we had to kind of get a little creative, but this was something that I was really interested in exploring. So yeah, great. And David, I know you had your hand raised, so I'll let you go. Mm -hmm. And David, you just have to unmute yourself. <laughs> I want to be so quick about this, and I uh, didn't pay attention. Great presentation. Let me repeat that. And secondly, uh, motivation, um, work employment is sometimes used in many of the social programs uh, that uh, are required. And I was wondering whether that overlapped at all with your work, but in addition, what you think about uh, its um, uh, potential for uh, improving or in many ways inhibiting uh, parenting? Um, too, so, too much in a 30 second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for my brain to digest. Do you mind repeating that? <laughs> uh, 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 simply, was uh, motivation required by any of the uh, 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 parents home visited, which might have been uh, generated by the social programs they were in? No. Uh -uh. No? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Diana. Great job. <laughs> and thank you to your family who, who also attended. That's great. Love it. All right. So now we're going to turn it to our third presenter, Simona Quillo. Um, and she attended Queen's University in Canada with a Bachelor of Science um, in Honors program with majoring in Life Sciences and minoring in Entrepreneurship. So, um, Simona, you can take it away whenever you are ready. And it looks like you are ready. Can you see my screen all right? Yep. Looks okay. Great. All right. Great. I, I know there's a lot of technical difficulties today, so hopefully everything goes smoothly. Um, I just want to say um, a big congratulations to Diana and Omaris for a great start to today's session. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Simona Coelho, and I'm going to be presenting today on my research in Brazil, which is a field observation study um, using the health promoting family conceptual framework. So just to provide an overarching view of my project, um, as part of my Global Health Established Field placement last year, I was able to conduct an in-person field observation in Fortaleza, Brazil, to explore concepts within maternal and child health and promotion and look at factors relating to child development. So I was actually able to travel in person, similar to Omaris's placement, and um, I was there for about three months during the fall of last year. And this project was in collaboration with the Universidade de Jofort Teleza and the Hopkins Center for Global Health. And field observations were done using a non-structured approach across facilities um, most relevant to MCH. And all observations were documented through photographs, note-taking, and unstructured interviews in either English or Portuguese that was later translated. So just as a disclosure, I just want to note that all pictures, quotes, and findings in the following slides um, have permission to be used for this presentation. So as a starting point for this work, I knew I needed a well-established framework to organize all the factors that contribute to MCH research. So while Brazil has undergone various changes in MCH services in recent years, there have been very few studies really looking at um, MCH promotion strategies. So the health promoting family conceptual framework um, developed by Pia Christensen was a great way to evaluate health promotion in Brazil. Um, it outlines how societal community and familial influences can play a part in promoting health um, and makes sure that the family is the key player in actively engaging and promoting child health. 
So as you can see here, the model is divided into two main sections of internal and external factors that are further divided into societal and community levels. So given the scope of my placement and my travels, um, I used just two factors in this model, the community influences and the family health practices as part of my field observation. So these are my aims for this study, and I want to emphasize that I used a two-fold model that takes away from the two sections I just mentioned in the, fr in the framework. So the first aim was to understand the community influences in relevant settings in Brazil, and my second aim was to understand the family-centered health practice piece, um, which was a bibliotherapy community-based pilot program aiming to prevent sexual violence in early childhood. So first, I'm going to take you through AIM-1 and some of the observations I saw there. So what I just want to emphasize is that in Christensen's model, child health is recognized as a plural construct that interplays with all of the factors we see here. So local community, friends and peers, school, et cetera. So I wanted to explore this interplay of different social actors to see if there really was a one-way transmission of health and practice um, into child health. So I focused on these three factors here, school, daycare, and healthcare services, and with uniform help, I was actually able to visit a few locations. So implementation, like I said, I want to focus on the three community level settings um, that were serving as health promoting actors in child health. And um, we actually attended a lot of MCH relevant locations, but for the purposes of this presentation, I just have three locations to show you. So the first location was Emprofa Bellarmina Campos Elementary School, which is located in Fortaleza, Brazil. Um, and I was able to talk to the students, the faculty, the staff to learn about how their school operates and how child health may be affected by certain barriers and facilitators. So there were several protective factors um, outlined, including a high quality of education and a nurturing environment. Since 2005, Brazil has actually experienced a one of the largest increases in national education quality indexes and in both primary and lower secondary education. So um, we see here on the left hand side, um, there was quite a quite a nurturing environment and there was a high quality of education despite some of the risk factors that we did find. So some of the um, barriers that we did see was that there were limited resources, including faculty. So Monica Frata, who um, is one of the academic coordinators here, she's in the picture, she um, was telling me that with the effects of the pandemic, there were a lot of limiting resources and there, the student to teacher ratio was very off. And there was also significant overcrowding. So to accommodate for this lack of space, um, as you can see on the right hand image, um, school desks were actually having to taken outside and students were actually offered to come back in person on the weekends instead of the weekday to get the extra time to learn if they couldn't learn during school hours. So next I visited a daycare, which is also part of this campus, and it was a daycare center. Um, and uh, there were a lot of protective factors that were identified, including good nutrition, physical exercise, and an established routine. The children that I interacted with um, had a very set routine, porridge breakfast by seven, fruits by nine, shower, lunch, another shower, um, dinner, and then going home. So very extensive. Um, schedule and the children did have to do certain activities that targeted broad motor coordination and there was a nutrition guided menu physical exercise rooms hygienic bathrooms and spacious play areas so the third piece was the health services and i actually did visit another hospital but um to to really emphasize what the public um, hospitals look like i was able to visit um, hospital Geral de fortaleza and it's a government hospital that was inaugurated in 1969, and it has grown so much since then. Um, so as you can see on the left-hand side, one of the biggest takeaways that I felt from visiting this location was the task sharing. So for those of you who don't know, task sharing allows healthcare providers to share responsibilities in order to efficiently provide care within a healthcare system. And in Brazil, nurses are considered a critical component of the public health care system, specifically in Sierra, which is the state that I was in. And on the right hand side, I was actually able to visit some of the emergency obstetric units and talk to some of the moms there. And it did highlight some barriers, including overcrowding and limited resources. Some of the rooms that I saw had four patients per room and some women who were were who just had babies were actually not assigned to any room at all. 
So that's a significant barrier that we definitely want to target with health promotion strategies. So next, I'm going to talk about AIM-2. So uh, AIM-2 covered, like I said, a family-centered program. So I was able to work with um, two graduate students at Unifor, Haisa Brito and Livia Gergel, and they were working on ongoing bibliotherapy pilot programs in rural regions of Sierra Brazil. So their programs specifically target prevention of sexual violence in early childhood, and they involve teaching families and mothers how to read to their children about sensitive topics like sexual violence. So what is bibliotherapy? Um, bibliotherapy has become an emerging therapeutic process and it involves books or written or computerized materials to help individuals digest those really complex psychological topics such as sexual violence, but they do it through stories and anecdotes in a way that young children can understand. So if we flash back back to the model, we know that family health practices are a significant portion of the family eco ecocultural pathway that operates to develop child health. So this is a snapshot of their bibliotherapy intervention timeline, and um, this is actually Livia's timeline for the for the upcoming months of May to October. So I was unfortunately, given the scope of my time there, I was only involved with pieces of this itinerary. So the first was I was able to help select a primary site location for um, Livia's project, which is now um, starting, and I was also able to help with the training of those community health workers that were going to help with um, teaching moms how to read to their children. So these were two significant pieces that I was a part of. And like I said, it's a very extensive program and um, it's still in the pilot stages, but with um, discussions at Unifor, they really want to scale up to a state, state model. So these are some pictures just from my visits. On the left-hand side, um, this is our training program and we were working with community health workers using books from the Happy Child program. And this was in Horizonte, Brazil. And on the right-hand side, on the right hand side, I was in Pacatuba, Brazil, and we had three locations to pick from and Livia ended up going with um, this location right here just based off of resources and just um, location for the women to access the bibliotherapy sessions. So some of the strengths and limitations of this um, project was that I really understand for strengths, I really understood the value of field observation. It really showed that social context is super pivotal in understanding maternal and child health promotion. It is not linear. There are multiple factors that definitely contribute to health promotion. And I was able to get firsthand experience in a lower middle income country. Some limitations um, were that um, there was obviously limited scope and timeline and external validity was compromised because my observations were certainly not exhaustive and indicative of all locations in Sierra and um, my sample size was very small, but it was giving me a start to see what we can observe among the risk and protective factors. Um, and also there was a lack of a well-defined outcome. If I were to do this project again, I would certainly pick a more specific child development outcome and I'm excited to you know, continue the work. So that takes me to future implications. Uh, with this work, there's, it's never ending and it's important to talk about the need for Sierra and you know, lower middle income countries more broadly to understand the key players in MCH promotion and implement scalable strategies. Um, so again, if I were to go back, I would definitely build on a well-defined outcome, tailor those bibliotherapy interventions for future scale up. So at the state and national level and create a standardized monitoring evaluation system to look to see if these programs are working and to see if these barriers are being accommodated. And I would definitely want to continue field observation work and I highly recommend it for anyone who has not done it. It, is, it gives you a greater scope of um, the social context that surround our research. And finally, I just want to give a thank you to everyone um, on the screen and everyone on this call. I had such a great support system 
especially those that were in Brazil taking care of me. Um, I want to give a special thank you to Dr. Mina Frota for taking, um, showing me around and being my eyes and ears in um, Brazil, and Dr. Wang, who's been with me for many late nights um, in these past few months. But I really appreciate everyone who supported me, and to my Brazilian family who took care of me for three months. Muito obrigada por me ajudar nesta pesquisa de saúde pública. So thank you so much, and let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Simona. Wonderful. So let me, um, again, just to remind folks, you can ask in the chat. I have it now open, or you can go ahead and raise your hand and unmute yourself. So any questions? Okay, Gretchen, you have your hand raised. Amazing, amazing job, Simona. Um, it seems like you had a wonderful time, but also did some really incredible work um, when you were in Brazil. Um, you mentioned doing training as part of one of the bibliotherapy pilot programs. I'm wondering what the training looked like and sort of what implementations you had um, during that training. Yeah, that's a really good question. And obviously with a 10-minute presentation, it's hard to cover all the bases. But yes, I was able to witness a training program with um, Haisa, who is one of the graduate students, and she just finished her um, PhD. Um, so the books that we use actually were collected from the Happy Child program. And this program utilizes the WHO UNICEF Care for Child Development Package. So it actually has a list of guidelines to build um, stronger relationships with caregivers and their children. So we were able to use these books and in the training session we worked with community health workers on what these books covered and how to you know, teach these moms and families how to read to their children. So in these books, they had texts and illustrations and it, they addressed very critical themes, including mental health and sexual violence. Um, and then after the training, we were able to conduct, you know, an anonymous survey um, to see if the training was successful and if they learned anything. And a lot of the participants were really happy to, um, to be a part of it. And um, I'm glad that, you know, the training exists in these rural regions as well, because, um, they need it most. Great. Question. All right, Kelsey, I see your hand up. Yeah, excellent job, Simona. So proud of you. Um, I have a question sort of along the lines of also what Amaris is talking about. Um, you were able to go to Brazil in person and that's amazing. Um, were there any logistical challenges uh, re-COVID or was it a totally seamless experience? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Um, I think there was a lot of um, logistical challenges, especially because, you know, with our placements, we were supposed to go in the summer months, but then the cases were really high last summer. And in Brazil, um, they are off in July for school. So um, I knew that if I wanted to go, I wanted to assess the school, the school culture and the daycare culture. So I wanted to go when, you know, people were in person, but also the cases were good um, and at a stable level. So um, I can't even thank the UNIFOR and the Center of Global Health enough for the travel approval process. It was very arduous, but we got through it. And um, I was able to go at a really great period because um, in October to December, um, I was able to see the final stages of a Hiesa's bibliotherapy pilot. And then I was also able to start um, Livia's project. So I was able to see both pilots um, given like, you know, different timelines and um, it's tough coordinating two university schedules. So um, I was really thankful it all worked out. But yes, a lot of logistical challenges traveling to an LMIC during the pandemic. But um, I'm glad some of us at um, who got the placement, I'm glad that we were able to go. Great. Thank you so much, Simona. Wonderful job again. All right, we're going to turn it to our fourth presenter, and that is Ashita Srivastava. And she attended the University of Pittsburgh um, with a Bachelor of Science, and she majored in neuroscience, minored in dance and chemistry, and a certificate in American Sign Language. So you were quite busy there. <laughs> so um, the title of her uh, presentation is called Social Environments of Sexual Violence on College Campuses in the United States, Rethinking the Values of Bystanders. So Ishita, you can take it away. I'm gonna be running her slides for her, Kristen. Oh, great, okay, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Kristen and Kristen. 
Um, so I'm going to be discussing sexual violence or SV today, and I'll start with some background on the next slide. All right, so contact sexual violence is experienced by over 33% of women and 25% of men at some point in their lives. Contact sexual violence is defined as a combined measure that includes rape, being made to penetrate someone else, sexual coercion, and or unwanted sexual contact. And specifically, college campuses are high risk environments for sexual violence. In fact, one in eight college students have been victimized by an unwanted sexual incident. So one of the most common sexual violence prevention programs implemented by colleges is bystander intervention. Bystanders are defined as individuals other than the survivor or the perpetrator who are present leading up to, during, and immediately after an incident of sexual violence. This intervention frames sexual violence as a community issue and encourages the active intervention of peers to prevent and interrupt unwanted sexual experiences. So my master's project was part of a parent study that sought to gather college student perspectives on unwanted sexual experiences. And today I'm gonna to be discussing my focus, which was on the efficacy of bystanders in sexual violence prevention on college campuses across the US. Uh, next slide, please. So we conducted community-based purposive sampling for breath across sexual violence experience type, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Eligible participants were 18 to 24 years old, current undergraduate students or recent graduates, and had an unwanted sexual experience during their undergraduate career prior to the pandemic. We conducted a total of 28 interviews via Zoom, and for my project, I analyzed the 22 participants whose data were available at the time. I actually conducted many of these interviews myself and proceeded to dual code the interview transcripts with my team. Through analysis, I identified that the level of engagement from bystanders varied based on sexual violence experience type and affiliation to survivors and perpetrators. So I organized my results by affiliation type and experience type. For affiliation, there were three main types. The first were survivor affiliates. And so these are people who share a closer relationship with the survivor, such as their friend. The second type are perpetrator affiliates. So those are people who are closer to the perpetrator, such as their roommate. And the third type were strangers. For experience types, there were two types of contact sexual violence experiences with or without unwanted sexual penetration. In our sample, the bystanders present for contact incidents were survivor affiliates or perpetrator affiliates. Non-contact sexual violence experiences mainly occurred in the presence of strangers. So on the following slides, I'm gonna be discussing the themes presented in the results and have selected a few illustrative quotes from the interview transcripts for you to read. Next slide, please. So starting with survivor affiliates, survivors reported expecting that their affiliates would step up if the situation had been more conducive to intervention, but then they also noted that there was a decreased chance of these conditions being met. A common example shared by participants was that Better lighting would have allowed their friends to more easily notice if they showed physical discomfort or were missing for a long period of time. At the same time, they expressed the understanding that increased lighting is undesirable for environments like bars and parties. So this participant shares that her friends probably would have stepped in to interrupt the non-penetrative contact incident, but likely didn't because they couldn't see what was really going on because of the bad lighting. Next slide, please. Another common issue that was noted by survivors was that their affiliates often missed opportunities to intervene due to having skewed perceptions of the incident. As this quote illustrates, the survivor was around at least one other trusted person who wishes she had recognized, who she wishes had recognized the true unsafe nature of the situation. In the interview, she noted that maybe these other people were also drunk, so they saw the situation as something different from what it truly was. She expresses how difficult it is to look back and realized that maybe this unwanted penetrative incident would not have happened if one of the other people present had realized what was actually going on and offered to walk home with her. Next slide, please. One participant did share a successful bystander intervention, and I encourage you to read the quote and will share that this interview stands out to me because of how grateful the survivor was that her friend was able to step in. Her friend was a buffer between her and a guy who kept bothering her. 
Then the friend continued to socialize as the survivor went to the bathroom, but eventually the friend noticed that the survivor and the perpetrator were both missing. She ended up finding out that the survivor was trapped in the bathroom with the perpetrator and banged on the bathroom door until she was let out. This survivor affiliate helped prevent a non-penetrative contact incident from progressing into an even more violent penetrative incident. So this is an example where the survivor affiliate did fulfill her social intention of being engaged in a party as a college student, but also upheld her responsibility as a bystander by looking out for her friend and correctly identifying an unsafe situation. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna move on to perpetrator affiliates. And as a reminder, we're still only discussing contact sexual violence experiences. So for perpetrator affiliates, in general, survivors did not find them to be trustworthy since these bystanders shared a closer relationship with the perpetrator than with the survivor. Survivors also shared that although perpetrator affiliates could likely hear or witness the incident occurring, they might not be aware of the true non-consensual nature of the sexual experience. As this participant notes, maybe the people around him didn't realize that he was being groped without his consent. Maybe they thought he actually wanted to be involved in that interaction and thus didn't do anything about it. Next slide, please. This misperception was also seen in cases where perpetrator affiliates assumed that sexual experiences between partners was consensual. Multiple participants shared experiences of intimate partner violence that were not recognized as sexual violence by those around them. This theme also speaks to the issues survivors of intimate partner violence face in general, where their experiences may not be recognized or taken as seriously, since others may assume that being in a relationship implies permanent consent. Next slide, please. So thus far, we've been discussing the influence of bystanders during contact sexual violence experiences. And now we're gonna shift our focus to non-contact experiences. So these are unwanted verbal or nonverbal interactions, but no touching. These incidents, namely verbal harassment, tended to occur in the presence of strangers who often didn't intervene. There was a general sense of understanding from survivors that strangers wouldn't get involved since it didn't seem that there was much help that they could provide. As this participant discusses her catcalling incident, she shares, no one did anything. I mean, I guess there's not much you can do in that situation. Like, what really are you going to do? So overall, bystander intervention was found to be the least effective in non-contact sexual violence experiences. Next slide, please. So let's review. What have the results shown us? We started with discussing survivor affiliates, where survivors believed that their affiliates would, inter would intervene if they could, but also noted that there were multiple barriers to this, such as bad lighting or the affiliate skewed perception of the incident. So what we're seeing here is that the expectation of bystander intervention efficacy is not matching the reality. Campus climates require students to balance many social factors and placing the onus on these students to do so while also monitoring other people for the risk of sexual violence is a considerable ask. If the bystanders are present, but unable to recognize the unsafe nature of an incident, how helpful can they really be? We then discussed perpetrator affiliates and strangers and while the expectations of these bystanders more accurately reflected reality, the results also showed the lack of efficacy of bystander intervention in these situations. And not only were perpetrator affiliates not trusted by survivors, but they also failed to recognize the non-consensual nature of the sexual experience. And this was especially true in cases of intimate partner violence. So again, we're seeing the presence of bystanders, but a lack of intervention. And as for strangers, Survivors didn't expect them to intervene, and they also did it. There are some limitations to be noted. We aimed to oversample Black and LGBT, LGBTQ participants since they're two historically underrepresented groups in the field of sexual violence. But even with oversampling, it was difficult to achieve the desired level of diversity. Additionally, our eligibility criteria limited our sample to participants who had an unwanted sexual experience so thus a lot of the sample includes incidents with unsuccessful bystander interventions. This did prove to be helpful for our purposes since it allowed us to identify gaps in the efficacy of bystander intervention. And overall results underscore the threat of over-reliance on bystander intervention. These data illustrate that while this intervention can be successful and incredibly helpful, 
it's not sufficient as the predominant sexual violence prevention programming on college campuses. These results should be used to inform where and how bystander intervention is useful and where gaps are identified, additional prevention programming is needed to better support potential victims. So the next slide are my references. And then um, after that, I have my thank yous. So I have a ton of people I'd like to thank. Um, I'd like to start with Dr. Decker, my first reader, my PI, my mentor. Thank you for everything. My HSM study team, uh, Dr. Holiday Nwaru, my advisor, the CDC and all of our study partners and our study participants for uh, sharing their stories with us. And then of course, my cohort, my friends, my family, and my boyfriend. Thank you all for all of your support. Great job, Lisa. All right, I'm going to quickly open it up for questions. So hopefully we have some um, right away because we are running um, tight on time. So I see Haley, why don't you go for it? <laughs> Yeah, great job, Ashita. I think these findings are really important. Um, just thinking about reports of sexual violence and the need for privacy and confidentiality, I wondered if you could talk about how you could ensure some of those things, considering you did um, some of your interviews on Zoom. Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Um, so that was definitely something we had to consider. So we started with email correspondence. We told them, we told our participants to please find a private space away from others and use headphones to give them more privacy. And we reiterated this once we were on Zoom with them and also checked in verbally with the participant um, if we were ever concerned that someone else might be there. We also asked participants to change their screen names so their real names would not show up on the video recordings or the audio transcripts. And they were also allowed to keep their videos off altogether if they wanted to. And video recordings were always deleted as soon as the transcript was verified. Thanks. Great. Mona. Again, such, such amazing work. Sorry, I feel like I'm hogging a lot of the questions today, but um, <laughs> um, something that I was wondering about was um, why did your eligibility criteria actually only include, I think it was, was it pre-pandemic experiences? I'm wondering if maybe during the pandemic there were other experiences that could have shifted or were different. Yeah, exactly, thanks. Um, so we did only limit our sample to pre-pandemic experiences. And that was because we recognized that the safety precautions that colleges put in place distinctly changed the physical and social environments of the campuses. So we knew we would have significant differences between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic experiences. Wonderful, thank you so much. This was such important work, um, really great job. Okay, so now um, our final presenter for the today is Thomasina Watts, and um, she attended Indiana University with a Bachelor's of Science in Community Health and a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology. And the title of her presentation is called Prioritizing Warning Signs, Education and Home Visiting Programs, a Qualitative Evaluation of the Empower Moms Pilot. So Thomasina, whenever you can, you can go ahead and share your screen. Hello, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as mentioned, the title of my presentation is Priority, Prioritizing Warning Signs Education and Home Visiting Program. It's a qualitative edition of the 2021 Empower Moms Warning Signs Education Pilot. So in the United States, the pregnancy mortality rate has increased steadily for the since 1987, the mortality has been doubled and continues to rise, and it is especially prevalent in this, in this disparity is especially prevalent in communities experiencing socioeconomic disparity. More than 60% of pregnancy-related deaths are reported to be present, preventable, and evidence has shown that patient lack of knowledge about warning signs has indicate about the warning signs needed that indicate the need to seek medical care during a pregnancy is a contributing factor to these preventable deaths. So we believe that having a standard practice of providing education to women during their pregnancy and during the postpartum period could contribute to reducing these deaths. One potentially effective way to provide this education would be to engage with home visiting programs. Home visiting programs are designed to provide preventative services for families, for supporting family health and with a specific focus on low-income families. 
Um, the Health Resource and Service Administration has been nationally supporting home visiting programs through evidence-based maternal infant and child, and the evidence-based maternal infant and child and early child home visiting program, also known as MICV, and since 2010, and it supports um, pro, and it supports programs all throughout all 50 states, DC, and the five US territories. So it's pretty well established. So the maternal and postpartum warning signs education and um, education and recognition for moms program was designed with the um, MD moms partnership here in Baltimore. Um, it is designed to encourage and support home visiting programs and other maternal child services to provide warning signs educations to clients. The toolkit itself includes two training sessions. The first with Johns Hopkins medical doctors providing information on warning signs for maternal complications, as well as on maternal mor morbidity and, matern and mortality statistics here in the US. And the second, a second training focuses on educating home visitors on how to provide warning signs education to their clients. The toolkit itself, itself includes a warning signs pamphlet and a magnet with a description of the 15 maternal warning signs to share with home visiting clients, an education guide for warning signs discussions with home visitors, an implementation tool, and a data collection tool for, manage, for program managers. And the details on the toolkit components are outlined here, and there's more details within my paper. So... The objective of the pilot program itself was to assess the use of the Empower Moms package among organizations serving diverse communities in Maryland. The logic model that has been illustrated here um, shows the intended sequence of events during pilot, during pilot program implementation, as well as the short-term and long-term goals of the program following adjustments of the toolkit and the eventual dissemination of the evaluation results. My evaluation specifically focuses on the processes and outputs of the program, specifically on feedback on, accept, on acceptability of the materials and fidelity to use. The report itself is focused on qualitative feedback. However, additional quantitative data were collected and will be evaluated and presented separately at a later date. So how was data collected and analyzed? Primarily collected through interviews and focus groups with program staff and clients. So focus groups were encouraged, focus groups themselves encouraged dialogue and open conversation, while individual interviews allowed for researchers to tease out information that may have been suppressed in larger group settings. Um, and we also were able to conduct two client interviews and we were, based on the nature of the conversations, we thought it would best to just stick to interviews. The pilot itself took place from February of 2021 to September of 21, and the research team members collected data from March through September with interviews and focus groups being held in August. Data analysis and dissemination planning took place immediately afterwards. So this is the framework for, that we used for my evaluation. So analysis was conducted using an adaptive framework method with home visitor and client capacity interactions being identified and examined through the COM-B model, which stands for capability, opportunity, and motivation leading to behavior. Capability refers to skills, knowledge, and ability to execute a behavior, which will be either the delivery of warning signs or the personal use of warning signs. Opportunity refers to external factors making the behavior possible. And motivation is the conscious and unconscious cognitive processes that direct and inspire behavior. And I just here I kind of outlined how those might potentially interact and what we thought what we would see within our um, feedback that we received. So what did we see? What were the results like? We conducted five individual interviews and seven focus groups with focus groups having between two and nine participants and a total of 39 women participated, including eight home visiting managers, 29 FSS, which is family support services, staff and two clients. So we found that Overall, study participants reported that what they, when they had the opportunity, they disseminated the warning signs education. Home visiting staff and clients expressed overwhelming support for the warning signs education toolkit materials and the training. And home visiting staff reported that the materials were easy to use with clients and helped guide conversations that were sometimes difficult to have. Having the tools in multiple languages also helped with client comprehension and the tools were helpful, that were most helpful, were, that were considered most helpful were the magnet and the pamphlet. 
So we also specifically evaluated barriers of facilitators. So the overarching theme was that home visitor buy-in was the most influential, influential facilitator, specifically home visitors believing that what they were doing was an important part of their job, was a natural part of their duty, and was valuable. Conversely, a lack of buy-in was a noted barrier for implementation with many home visitors not being sure about needing to include information in the visits or feeling that it wasn't within their purview. COVID-19 restrictions were also a noted barrier and, potential in, and a potential influence on home visitor buy-in. In terms of client use of the tools, facilitators for client use primarily focused on engagement with clients. So whether or not the clients felt that the FSS were looking out for their best interest, that the information, whether or not the information was understandable and applicable to their life, and whether or not they were able to continue to feel supported outside of home visits. Conversely, issues with engaging with home care, home with healthcare bit providers, excuse me, were a noted barrier from both home visitors and client perspectives, with clients reporting that they felt dismissed by providers or felt that they wouldn't receive support, so they overlooked their personal feelings about the, any concern that they have and just kind of ignored any warning signs that they might be experiencing. So, in conclusion, in summary, the toolkit was acceptable. The overarching themes for facilitators and barriers were, were focused on buy-in from staff members and feedback on the materials, as well as the ability to advocate for clients was immediately implemented. And the implementing, and in terms of implementation specifically, feedback that supported from managers that supported regular trainings on warning signs education, as well as potentially including a mechanism allow of uh, reporting allowed for staff to stay on task. So managers reported that having the implementation and data collection tool were incredibly helpful and might be considered uh, an integral part of the Empower Moms toolkit moving forward. And we also worked on including on implementing advocacy support based on the feedback that saying not having being able to advocate was an issue. Okay, so in terms of strength and limitations, aside from the known strength and limitation of qualitative evaluation, there are some unique um, strengths and limitations I wanted to highlight today. Some, one of them was the commun initial community engagement during the formative research. It was incredibly important for building trust and recruitment, and it also was important to help with the material ease of use. So a lot of home visitors reported being able to remember what we did and remember why it was important based on the formative research that we had done. Um, and then the, the actual ease of material use. So the materials being easily incorporated into their regular work, as well as easy to understand, helped a lot with making sure the program went smoothly. Um, some of the unique limitations included um, the FSS feeling overburdened with tasks to the point sometimes they were in, like they were working with other studies or things like that. So they would feel that they didn't recognize what the Empower Moms um, pilot was focusing on. They didn't really, they weren't really sure what we were trying to evaluate. But um, they also, and it was also strongly implicated or impacted by COVID. So a lot of programs were kind of shaken by how COVID like, cha it changed a lot of how the programs typically acted and how they implemented, how they would have implemented the um, a toolkit prior to COVID, but they they still tried their best. And so the strengths and limitations will be addressed in further scale up discussions later and hopefully will be made so we can adjust for COVID or any other type of pandemic in the future. So in terms of anticipated use of results, there are already discussions happening about what national scale up will look like and the recommendations are already being incorporated into future iterations of the Empower Moms toolkit. Um, there also HRSA has been talking to us about how we can include it and like they make these guidelines and things like that, which is very exciting. Um, dissemination of the work we feel is incredibly important and it was it's necessary for equitable access. So I personally have decided thought that the Wanderman's interactive system, um, the dissemination translation model that they put together could be selected to guide scale up because it includes perspectives of multiple stakeholders and uses an iterative approach, which indicates flexibility and opportunities for community level support. Um, hopefully, it could be used to share the Empower Moms tools nationally and improve pregnancy outcomes for women in the United States. So, yeah, thank you guys. Um, thank you to the Empower Moms team, Drs. Kriyanga and Callahan Koru who guided the evaluation and gave me the opportunity to work with them for the past year. It's been great. Um, my advisors, Dr. Zimmerman, and also Dr. Mari for giving me so much feedback and support. Thank you so much. My family and friends have been very select, like very supportive and have listened to me cry and scream about this and everything, love it. And then my cohort members and classmates, we did it, thank God, okay.
Any questions? <laughs> Great job. Thank you so much, Thomasina. All right, let's open it up for questions. And just to remind everyone, you can use the chat or you can go ahead and unmute yourself, raise your hands. Uh, I see Gretchen and then Kelsey. Thomasina, amazing, amazing, amazing work. And yes, thank God we all made it through together. Um, so congratulations. Um, one of the you. questions I had was how you, how and why you selected the COMB framework um, as a guide for this analysis and evaluation. Thank you. So um, thank you for the compliment. We decided it within our group. Um, so we had several meetings, of course, as it's an iterative, iterative process. And we talked about the themes that we saw emerging when we first began to review the transcripts that we have. And we decided that there were other models that were a bit more unwieldy or kind of like they would have made the, it wasn't appropriate. And we thought that the combi one effectively reviewed the evaluation as well as talked about behavior, which is what we were kind of looking to like to review, if that makes sense. So we thought it was most appropriate. Also thought that it wouldn't lead to too much granularity. Like it wouldn't like make our, our information not applicable at all. So we thought it was an appropriate framework. <laughs> Thank you. Great, uh, Kelsey. Yeah, thanks. Um, excellent job, Thomasina. Um, you were talking about engagement with the target population uh, while developing the toolkit. Um, and you briefly mentioned that there might be potential opportunities for more engagement in the future. Um, do you feel like you missed opportunities for participant engagement along the way? It's a great question. Um, I would say that there's all, as a person who is a strong proponent of community-based participatory research, there's always an opportunity for more engagement with the community. Um, I think within the pilot, we did a pretty good job, but there was of course the opportunity to ask the home visiting per, or, the actual home visitors, if they were interested in asking questions to the client, so helping them or develop the interview guides alongside of us, or giving them the opportunity to even decide what kind of how dissemination should look. Like there's so many opportunities for community engagement, even in like smaller ways that we wouldn't necessarily think of. So of course there were, but I think that our team did an amazing job. So thank you for asking. <laughs> All right. Well, it is 1:25, so I want to just say thank you Thomasina and I want to give a shout out to everyone who presented today all five of you did a fabulous job I also want to thank all of you who are first readers and secondary readers and all of you who are advisors it um it takes a lot of work behind this and I want to really thank all of you for that and finally Kristen McCormick for all of the logistical um, work that you've done behind the scenes so really really appreciate that so with that, I want to thank you all again, and uh, we will see you all tomorrow, same time, for another great round of presentations.